Uh, so thank you very much, Mr Beasley, for your time today. Um, and congratulations on your honorary doctorate being awarded to you this week by Notre Dame University. So if maybe you can just tell us what does this mean uh, for you in terms of how do you, how do you feel about being awarded this honorary doctorate? Well, I'm very honoured to receive it. Um, it's the first and I suspect the only one I'll ever get. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm really very chuffed about that. But, uh, but more, to, uh, more to the point is the fact that Notre Dame is a university that I've followed with fascination uh, since, uh, since it was being created. Um, I, the folk who are involved in the creation of the university, some of them were personal friends, close, close personal friends actually. And it was, it seemed like a, an enterprise doomed not to succeed. Uh, nobody has attempted that with the university in Australia prior to this. And uh, they, uh, to try to uh, draw in upon uh, us here in little Western Australia, you know, the great centuries old Catholic uh, tradition of learning, and to turn it into the, the sort of spiritual and intellectual foundation of, a, uh, of, a, of an institution set up here. It could suggest it might be a little grandiose that, uh, that anyone would decide to do that, but it has gone extraordinarily well. And basically, I think it has gone very well because of the building block character of the, the decisions that folk have taken. Firstly, they picked the best place in Western Australia to locate a university. The, the area which it inhabits just lends itself to you know, a small, uh, dare I say, boutique educational establishment. And they've gradually acquired it. So very American, actually, mm. the way in which it's gradually acquired the neighbourhood. Uh, in order to make sure they can satisfy the students' needs. So they've got a, a, a beautiful physical environment, but also the intellectual building blocks start off with what you absolutely have to do. If I had a mission in the Kimberleys, for example, in Aboriginal education, so that's a focus. They have, there's a, uh, a requirement in this state because we did not have the old tradition of teachers' colleges, which are the ACU, uh, ultimately built upon in the East, you actually had to work out a way you could staff the, the teachers of Catholic schools, so they have that, and then they have the education of priests. And then over time, a whole range of other activities have been added, but all the time, keeping it within the framework of um, a little bit beyond where their ambitions should really lead them, uh, but not so uncontrollably beyond that the thing falls apart. So. You know, to be honoured by an establishment that has worked itself out so well and has such an interesting spiritual dimension to it uh, is, uh, is pretty flattering, frankly. And do you find that that, um, that spiritual development, um, an element, sorry, in um, front of education is, is relevant for um, our young people today, the, the ones that are attending the universities and even the, the mature age students that are attending the universities today? Well, look, absolutely. You know, I think that uh, in many ways this is a somewhat more conservative generation of young people than, than my generation. It's, it's much more um, supportive, mm -hmm. if you like, mutually supportive. It's got a, uh, and it, it's got a high, it, it, it assigns high value to intellectual attainment. And uh, so it's sort of, I, I think it's a, a university that exactly suits the sort of mindset of, uh, of young people who are looking out on the, their future lives and uh, that something's got to account for the fact that a lot of people want to go to it mm. and increasingly it's their first or second choice university. In, in light of that as what you've just been mentioning and, and um, the, the spirituality in, in dimension in front of an education Maybe you can tell us a bit about your own education and post that, where you undertook some missionary work in India, I believe. Um, and how, what did that, what did that experience do to form you um, uh, as an adult, and you know, in terms of your political outlook, your and your experience now? Well, firstly, my education was profoundly secular. I went to uh, I went to government schools. Uh, none of my daughters have; they've all gone to Catholic schools. But I, I went to government schools, then to the University of Western Australia, then to Oxford University, then to Teach at Murdoch University. So my 
uh, my, uh, my whole experience, personally, has been within the, within the framework of a sort of conventional, secular Australian structure. That's the first point. The second point is uh, the, the activity that I did in India was not strictly missionary in the way in which uh, Christians would understand it to be. It was associated with a movement that was then called Moral Rearmament. It's changed over the years. It's now uh, an organisation called Initiatives for Change. But it wasn't explicitly Christian, though it was informed by Christian values. But it was spiritual and, and, and it was moral and its efforts were fundamentally directed towards what you might call individual and societal improvement. And um, so that, uh, I, I went to India, I loved India. Uh, I guess the most profound influence it had on me was to determine that uh, my undergraduate degree was a major in Indian history. But um, uh, in politics, I would say that uh, just my life, my experience with my father, the sort of issues that he took up, the, the, the sort of character of politics in the 1960s and 70s, um, that was more influential on me uh, than, uh, than perhaps the experience in India. So then also looking at how so many young people today um, take on, a, I suppose, a greater social approach, um, with attendance at events such as schoolies. Maybe you can enlighten us in how some of the young people can perhaps look at other ways of, of forming themselves. Well, it's only about a week's worth of bad behaviour. I mean, <laughs> in my day, it was sort of years of it. <laughs> so, uh, so I think, uh, I mean, sc schoolies is, uh, is something there to be survived and 99% of folk do. Uh, so the casualty rates are huge, but uh, they're not insubstantial either. And uh, having seen three daughters go through some facsimile of it. But you know, it's interesting. See, in my electorate, I represented the seat of Brand. I actually also represented Swan before that, but Brand I represented during what you might describe as a sort of schoolies type era, because it's really a product of about the last 20, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Didn't do that sort of thing. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, but they don't do schoolies in Bran. Mm. Working class kids, kids from uh, backgrounds of not high income, mm. don't do that. Mm. When they leave school, they're either going straight into training or work. So it's a sort of um, a sort of western suburbs, but you know, somewhat outgrowth from that type phenomenon probably somewhat more associated with the private sector of education, which after all educates about 30% mm. of our kids, than it is government, though the government uh, schools are engaged as well. In terms of looking at you know, um, your leadership roles, what advice um, from your experience, Mr Beasley, can you give um, young Catholics and young Christians today who are looking to become good and you know, possibly great leaders Look, I would give them the same advice that I give to everybody who asks me a question about engagement in politics. Because a lot of people approach that as uh, a sort of a career choice. Uh, and uh, as though there's, well, I could be a policeman, or I could be a, an academic, and I could be a member of parliament. No, uh, that's not what politics is about. Firstly, you have to work out what you believe. And you have to uh, come to a conclusion that uh, irrespective of whether or not you're going to personally succeed in this endeavour, and it will be a major part of your life's career, that you have things that you adhere to which you are prepared to pursue, as I said, irrespective of your own personal success. You've got to believe something. If you don't believe it, frankly, if you don't believe something, Frankly, you're dangerous. You're danger an ambitious person without foundation in the way in which they see the world and what they want to create in it is a dangerous person in politics. So my first advice is don't go into politics unless you really believe something. You may form a set of convictions that naturally pushes you towards the Liberal Party or a set of convictions that pushes you to the Labor Party, but have the convictions. Okay. So maybe you can tell us then what do you believe as former opposition leader 
uh, and federal minister in a variety of roles should and could the government here in Australia um, and around the world and the governments around the world in that sense um, be doing to promote um, good beliefs, good values, um, sound even perhaps Christian values where possible. I think you've got to divide these things into two particular zones. Uh, one is that what you bring to politics yourself in the way in which you have developed within yourself values and beliefs about uh, what is important about government and what is important about society. So uh, if, you, if you do uh, have a set of Christian commitments, then they do inform your judgments. And it's important that they do that because you can bring to the political life of the nation a set of perspectives which is, uh, produces sanity in, in systems which don't necessarily adhere to same principles. That's, one, that's, that's how I think uh, a Christian commitment ought to be brought into politics. There's another way of doing it, and that I think can, is potentially dangerous and that is to structure a set of arguments and say that these, argue, these positions must be held because it's got a divine ordination behind it. And uh, there are a lot of people who believe things like that uh, mm. when you look around the system globally. And quite frankly, things which are just simply uh, said to be religiously based are often quite evil. In, uh, in what is being pursued, and it sort of gives, gives people a, 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 a perverse freedom to commit evil acts mm. in the sense that they think that they have God on their side to do it. Uh, when I last um, gave the matter serious consideration, I found it very difficult to come to the conclusion that God was a member of the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, <laughs> and that uh, the, the success or otherwise of those political forces actually had anything to do with his purposes at all. And you have one additional problem if you happen to be a Christian as opposed to any other particular religion and you're looking at whether or not you want to join your, your religious beliefs to uh, an argument about a political program and why people should adopt it. And that is, as, as Christians, one of the things that you simply must not do is to stand in the way of somebody else's experience of the cross. So if you go and tell someone that unless you believe this about this aspect of education, this about this particular health policy, is if you don't believe that, then, then obviously you cannot be being informed by Christian values or Christian principles. It can have several effects, uh, and one of those effects can well be that that person comes to think that you might be right. And, but nevertheless, intellectually, they can't agree with you on the policy, and therefore that will affect that person's ability to place themselves in a situation where they can experience the cross, where they can accept, accept Jesus as Saviour, where they can look at, the, uh, at the, the teachings of the church as a moral underpinning for their life. You can endanger uh, people's mortal soul and therefore yours. Now I remember, I mean, my father he was, was a very religious man, uh, very deeply committed. But uh, he was always worried when he saw faith being attached to uh, a political process. But he nevertheless used to view it with some degree of humour. So back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, before each election he'd send his Catholic organisers around the churches. And if it was a social justice Sunday, he'd win by about 10,000 votes. But if it was an anti-communist Sunday, he'd win by about 5,000. So that was the, uh, so it, has, it had an impact, but, um, but he saw in particular the sort of sectarian fights in the Labor Party in the 50s as having really destroyed the religious comfort and, uh, of a lot of his Catholic friends in the, in the Labor Party of the day, which has made him, made him in his later life quite uh, suspicious. Uh, of those who attached a specific religious commitment to a specific political party. That's nothing to do with being informed by the values that you develop mm. as a result of the experience you have with your faith. Maybe just um, heading towards a sort of conclusion um, as well, just 
Um, looking at your time in politics then, how can you say society has changed? Is society um, growing, I suppose, in values? Are we becoming more selfish or you know, are we becoming more giving? So are we you know, growing in values or in a positive, negative sort of light? We're infinitely more socially interconnected. I mean, the social media now dominates politics. Um, it, uh, folk would think, and I suppose, I suppose most of those who looked at uh, the change in technologies and communications, that it was going to bring the world closer together. It certainly makes the world more informed about what is going on. But generally speaking, the, the principal beneficiaries of the spread of social media have been, those, have been those who want to disseminate lies, those who want to disseminate calumnies, those who want to separate uh, or develop a sense of, uh, of identity politics as subsuming all. And it's proved very difficult, uh, much more difficult now than in my day to get, a, in, in, at least when I started in politics, to actually get in a sense of collective social responsibility. We're being much more atomised and uh, in, in some ways desensitised by the ability to be abusive anonymously. It's a, uh, there's a lot of challenges that contemporary generations face and I think the, uh, perhaps one of the effects of that have been to make people slightly more conservative under themselves, you know, exercising a lot more deliberate judgement about the way in which they, uh, which they behave. This is, this is a much more moral generation uh, than uh, the generation uh, uh, that I, student generation I grew up in, but probably less committed to the big picture than the way in which we committed to the big picture back in the 60s and 70s. Well, that's um, just about it, Mr. Beasy. Thank you very Good. much for your time. No worries. So, uh, well, that was pretty your... painless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be. Uh, I, can, I can do like a you know A C type twenty question.